Okay, yeah, well thanks for the, if one can hear, yeah, sounds it's clear. You can hear at the back? Yeah, great. So, yeah, many thanks for the invitation to, to speak here. Uh, so, let me see. So this is the, four, the first of four lectures. Um, we'll roughly follow the topics as it is in the schedule, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes in terms of time. Also, in a few minutes, someone will be coming with a copy of these notes to give out to all of you. So I'm going to be following these notes, but you're going to have a copy uh, soon. Okay. All right, so most of these lectures are going to be about uh, transport. So that's uh, like uh, conductivities. And so I think the, other, the various other lectures are going to be telling you about various exotic phases of matter and various theories that describe those. But one observable that you would like to calculate because it's the easiest to measure are, are conductivities or resistivities. However, these, these quantities, something like an electrical or a thermal conductivity, are actually extremely subtle. And so even once you know the theory, uh, it's not always easy to calculate the resistivity in that theory. All right? So what these lectures are going to be about are subtleties having to do with calculating transports or conductivities uh, in, in unconventional theories. Okay? So before I tell you about unconventional theories, let me just remind you about uh, conventional theories or conventional metals. So I'm, gonna, I'm not going to derive anything, but I'm briefly going to remind you of a series of properties that you can find in any, any uh, solid state uh, quantum uh, condensed matter textbook. So uh, I remind you that most metals, at a microscope, from a microscopic point of view, are, are strongly interacting in the sense that if I take a typical electron, I'll find that its kinetic energy is comparable to its potential energy due to Coulomb interactions, and that means you can't treat the interactions as an expansion parameter, and that's one definition of what you mean by strongly interacting. Okay. However, what Landau uh, pointed out over 50 years ago now is that at low energies, there's an emergent weakly interacting description and the things that interact weakly at low energies, he called, he blessed us with this, I think, not very elegant name, uh, quasi-particles. Okay, and there's nothing quasi about them except the fact that they're not electrons. Okay, they're dressed, they're collective excitations. Okay, but they're particles. All right. Uh, so uh, the statement of Landau is that the reason that Judah and all of these people from the turn of the century before quantum mechanics got the right answer for a lot of things but by just using sort of billiard ball pictures of, of uh, weak, classical pictures of things moving in metals was because there's an emergent weakly interacting description in conventional metals and the things that interact weakly are these quasi-particles that have the same quantum numbers as the microscopic electrons but they're not the same thing. For example, their mass could be a thousand times bigger than the bare electron mass. Okay. So what, does, what comes with this notion of quasi-particles is some structure. So with quasi-particles comes the fact that the Hilbert space is a, is a Fox space um, of these weakly interacting quasi-particles. So we can build a given state by creating an excitation with some momentum uh, k, and then we can cre create many excite we can just superimpose the excitations by creating lots and lots of, we can sort of add particles to the system. Okay, well this C dagger creates a quasi-particle with momentum, momentum K. And so once we have these sort of creation operators for these free fields, as we would think of them, uh, we then, that means that there are infinitely many long-lived operators where a natural operator to work with is the density, the number operator for the number of quasi-particles with momentum k. Okay. So in particular, for example, in the Boltzmann equation, the basic variable is the expectation value, so delta nk is the expectation value of the number of particles with momentum k minus the equilibrium distribution, which is just the Fermi Dirac, Fermi Dirac distribution. 
right? So in a, in a weakly interacting metal at low temperatures, you imagine there, there are these particles, they're in some Fermi Dirac distribution, and the excitations of the system are described by uh, well, creating little bumps in this distribution. And, and so moving, you can create some particles with some momentum, deplete the particles with a lower momentum, and, and we have to keep track of these excitations. Is that, that okay? And by long-lived, I mean because th there are essentially no interactions between these quasi-particles, if I set an electron, a quasi-particle moving with some momentum k, it stays moving with that momentum k for a long time. Eventually it scatters off something, but that takes a long time. All right? So the building blocks for these weakly interacting uh, metals are sort of microscopically these creation operators or these fluctuations of the density. Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Um, so the other thing I should uh, define are what I mean by long-lived. Okay, and so what we're going to mean uh, throughout, uh, throughout these lectures is, so there's a characteristic time scale, one time scale that always exists in, in, in quantum mechanics is uh, what we could call the thermal time scale which is uh, h-bar or the kbt. And so if you have, now let's say, strong interactions so that all couplings were of order 1 and, and you have a system at a finite temperature, this is a natural scale that always exists. And I'm going to define uh, long to mean that the lifetime of these excitations is much bigger, much longer, and this thermal lifetime. Okay. We'll, co we'll come back to this. All right, so now, if, if once this is true, once you have these, these quasi-particles, they really organize everything, and there are a whole series of well-defined consequences for transport. So transport is, uh, so transport is the word for moving conserved densities around. So if there's a certain amount of charge in the system, the charge is conserved so we can keep track of it. Some of it's over here, I want to send it to you. That's going to be easy or difficult depending on, on the transport properties of the medium. All right? So transport, so conserved densities are going to be charge, heat, or energy. Uh, and sometimes momentum. Okay, these are all conserved quantities, and there's going to be a conductivity associated with how easy it is to move these quantities around. Okay. And so the basic quantity that quantifies how transport are the conductivities. So the electrical conductivity is written is written sigma. And when we have this weakly interacting description with this lifetime tau for the quasiparticles then the conductivity is given by the Druda formula, which is, I'm going to write like this. Okay, so n is the, the number of these quasiparticles. This is the fundamental charge. This is the mass of the quasiparticles. And this is the transport lifetime. Okay, now this transport lifetime is often just the quasiparticle lifetime. Okay, so let's consider this case first. And so that just tells you that so hopefully this formula, I hope you've all seen it before, but in any case, it should be intuitive because it says that if the, the longer the quasi-particles live, the better the thing conducts, right? Okay, so the resistivity is one over the conductivity. And so the longer they live, the smaller the resistivity. If their lifetime is very short, then um, uh, the resistivity is very large. Okay. Now, the reason there's this transport here is that sometimes not all scattering events contribute equally. Uh, so in particular, this transport lifetime can be different from the single particle lifetime uh, if, uh, for example, small angle scattering dominates. So I'll, I'll give you an example in a second.
well, actually, I'll give you an example right now. So suppose, so the classical example of this is scattering of electrons by phonons at, at uh, low temperatures, okay? So um, the electrons live on, on the Fermi surface, so that, that's Kf, this is the momentum space. Uh, so the electrons are out here, and so a low-energy electron carries quite a bit of momentum. And now let's say it's scattered by a phonon at low temperatures, an acoustic phonon, meaning, so an acoustic phonon has a dispersion relation that's, that's, that goes like this, and so a low-energy phonon also has a small momentum, okay? So w if a phonon kicks an electron, it can only change the, the momentum by a little bit, right? Because the phonon doesn't carry much momentum at low energies, all right? And so this means that uh, most scattering by, uh, by the phonons is, is, uh, is small angle scattering, okay? And, um, and small angle scattering is not very efficient in degrading the conductivity, right? So um, like a bigger scattering over here, this would completely kill the current. But so it, it, wait, if this angle is theta and that's small, uh, basically the transport lifetime is the quasi-particle lifetime and it gets weighted by a factor of sort of the average the average angle of scattering, okay? And this average, and so for example, for phonons, this goes like, there's a T squared. And so, because the typical, the scattering, typical scattering events do not grade the degrade the current efficiently, there's an extra suppression, okay? This is a textbook thing, I, it's a bit tangential. I'm just trying to explain why it's not quite the quasi-particle lifetime that goes here, but it's something that's easily derived from the quasi-particle lifetime. Sometimes you have to weight it by the fact that that, that typical scattering events don't degrade the, the current efficiently. Okay. This is tangential. So taking that into account, if you open, for example, Ashcroft and Merman, or any other textbook, you'll find a whole series of results for the conductivity or the resistivity, depending on what the scattering mechanism is that, that eventually kills these long-lived quasi-particles. So famous cases are uh, electron impurity scattering, where this is all at low temperatures, where the resistivity goes to a constant. So this is called the residual, the residual resistivity. Then you can have electron-electron scattering. That gives you a role that goes like T squared. Okay. Um, then there's electron phonon for temperatures above the Debye temperature. I'll tell you what that is in a second. There the resistivity is linear in temperature. And for electron phonon scattering at low temperatures, in three dimensions, the resistivity goes like T, T to the fifth. Okay? Yes? Yes, that's, uh, let, let me come back to that maybe. Uh, tomorrow. So, 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 um, um, yeah, let me, let me just leave that. So, so what, okay, let me repeat the question and then, and then tell why I'm going to come back to it later. So, uh, what he was complaining about is that at, at, at zero temperature, this is a constant. Um, but, uh, this is very large. Okay. And so the lifetime will be smaller than this thermal lifetime, okay, at, z at zero temperature. But this is still in quasi-particle space. And what's happening is that there are quasi-particles, but y they're not momentum eigenstates anymore. And so, and so, so, um, right. But let, let, let me leave that for the, for the moment. Yeah. Okay. Um, good. Uh, where was I? Very good. So I, let me say a few things about where these, this one comes from, for example, because we want to come back to linear and T. So this is a, a linear and T resistivity, and this is very easy to understand. Okay, this one happens because, so phonons, at, at low momenta, they have this dispersion, but actually the dispersion looks something like this, K and omega. And when you get to, to 1 over A, to the, to the lattice spacing, it, 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 well, it, has, it might bend over, but it, it certainly reaches some finite number here. It has a maximum. This maximum is the Debye frequency, 
Okay? And so this holds if you're at temperatures much bigger than the Debye frequency. Okay? And why does that? And, and so let's, let's derive this linear in T in this regime. Okay, so, sorry, that makes sense? So all a, a given phonon can have at most energy omega Debye. Okay? So you go to temperatures much bigger than that. All right? And then where this linear T comes from is how many phonons there are to scatter into. Okay? So the lifetime, the resistivity is 1 over the lifetime from that formula. And now this is the scattering rate. It's called a gamma. And the scattering rate is given by Fermi's golden rule. And Fermi's golden rule is proportional to how many things you have to scatter into. Right? The density, which this goes like rho final, the density of states you can scatter into. And this thing is going to be proportional to the number of phonons. Okay? Because the, mo the more phonons there are, it's clear that the rate at which you decay into phonons is going to be proportional to how many phonons there are. You know, I just want to, these are well-known things. I'm just sketching them. Uh, they might be useful later. So let me, let me derive. So what's the number of phonons? It's going to take me a while to optimize this blackboard use. Let me see. So the number of phonons is given by the Bose-Einstein distribution, which goes something like this. Number of phonons integrated over, over K. Uh, the energy over temperature minus 1. OK, but for all momenta, the, the frequency is bounded above. And where temperature is much bigger than this, so we can always expand this exponential for all the energies. So always, uh, where temperature is much bigger than all the energies. And so this becomes 1 plus E over T. The 1's cancel. The T goes on the top. And you get something like this. Okay? And this is the linear in T. All right? So for example, right, so the linear in T resistivity due to electron phonon coupling above the Debye temperature just happens because that's how many phonons there are to scatter into. Okay. Good. And so actually this T squared also comes from the same, the same kind of calculation. So any, any questions about this? Okay, so the main point I want to say is that if you have, if it's weakly interacting, you can just calculate everything and you know what you're doing. Okay. Um, this is widely observed, this is widely observed, this t to the fifth is widely observed. To get t squared, you need the electron-electron coupling to be strong enough that it beats the phonons, but that's also observed. Okay. All right, now also, let me say a few things. Very good. So these are things that you can just, yeah, again, you just, you just know, okay? They follow from very simple arguments. In the quantum field theory language, these are all one-loop calculations of the decay of the self-energy of, of, of an electron. Okay. Right. So another thing that's going to be useful later is also heat transport. So it's a basic property when you have quasiparticles that they carry both the same the same things are carrying both heat and charge, and so their lifetime enters the electrical conductivity, but also the thermal conductivity. All right, and so, and this is quantified by something called the Lorentz ratio, L, which is the thermal conductivity divided by the electrical conductivity, and there's a factor of T. So you can um, you can derive that if the scattering is dominantly inelastic, which I'll say something about in a minute, if you have quasiparticles, this is something called the Wittemann Franz law, and you get pi squared over three. Uh, K Boltzmann squared over E squared. Elastic. Okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Elastic, yes. Okay, and so this pi squared over 3 essentially comes from uh, integrals of the Fermi Dirac distribution. Okay? This, is, this, is, this directly comes from Fermi Dirac. Now, the re so all this is saying is that if you have your electron moving along and it dies at some rate, okay? That, that rate determines, enters in the same way in the thermal conductivity and in the electrical conductivity. The elastic is important because if the interaction 
also take away, takes away energy, so if it's inelastic, it also loses energy, then it will lose heat faster than it loses charge, right? Because the quasi-particles scattering loses momentum, but if it also loses heat, then if it's so inelastic, then you're going to get L less than this value. Because you also, cause the thermal conduction is worse because you lose energy as well. Okay. All right, and so the final, I want to say one more. So this is, I should say, this is very widely observed in almost in many, many conventional materials, even at room temperature, it's approximately true. Okay. And the final result, sort of, this is less textbook, but also quite well, reasonably well established, is that quasi-particles, under certain circumstances, imply a minimal resistivity. And this is called the Marty regel limit. And actually, it's formulated in various ways, but one, one th that makes some sense to me is the following. So it goes like this. If the quasi-particles have a well-defined momentum, now by well-defined momentum, I mean what you might mean in quantum mechanics, that the value of the momentum is bigger than the uncertainty in the momentum for a given particle. So it's crucial for this argument that you have these single particle states whose momentum you can talk about. Okay? So and this relates to the question earlier, okay? It's really important. So you might have, quasi, you might have weakly, interacting, weakly interacting excitations that are localized in space, for example, and they don't have a well-defined momentum, all right? So we need to be in, you need this, this picture, and then you go, it goes as follows. Uh, did I have to do the formula? No, I don't. Maybe it's here. No, it isn't, okay. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, let me write here. I'll use the Judah. Remember, the Judah formula was that the connectivity was n e squared tau over m. So, in a Fermi liquid, in a weakly interacting metal, n goes like that's the density. It's set by the Fermi the Fermi wave vector to the d. That that has the right units. That has the right units at least. Hopefully, that's reasonable. Uh, tau we're going to express it in terms of the mean free path. Is the Fermi velocity times the lifetime. That's how far it travels before it, uh, before it dies. And the mass, we can relate to the Fermi momentum. So m times vf is uh, kf, and then we have to put an h-bar to turn it into a momentum. Using these things in this formula, we get, and I'm not going to worry about factors of 2 and pi. Um, so there's the e squared. There's the h bar that came in through the mass. The n gives a kf uh, to the d. Now, there's going to be a 1 over vf. This tau will give a 1 over vf. It gives me an extra kf. Uh, so I'll be minus 1, and I want to take one of them out and write it like this. Now, if this is true, right, so if, if and Kf is equal to, K, that is the momentum that the electron's carrying, then this quantity is bigger than delta Kl, and to this, uh, I want to apply, apply an, the uncertainty principle, and so this is bigger than 1. K is not the momentum, it's related to the momentum by an h-bar. So delta P, delta X being bigger than h-bar means delta K, delta X is bigger than 1. Right? So this is how long the electron has. That's how, far it, that's, that's how long it's present. This is how well we know its momentum. And so that, that's, that's, we can apply a single particle uncertainty principle to that, and then we get that this connectivity should be bigger than 
e squared over h bar kf. Little d is always going to be the number of space dimensions. Um, yes. Yes. So this should be, that, that will be okay, I think, in this limit, because this L is going to be quite long. Again, this argument is not, it's not a, this is definitely not a, a theorem, but, um, yeah. but there's this argument. It goes like this. Um, let me, I just, so this is true. So this is observed to be true. In, in all conventional metals. So, so, so in particular, so this is particularly nice, it's particularly nice in two dimensions where this thing drops out and then this is a, a bound on, on the resistivity in terms of purely fundamental constants. And indeed, if you look at copper or, 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 or some basic element and you plot the resistivity as a function of temperature, it, it looks, well, it does whatever it wants to do in the middle and then they tend to saturate. You know, I'm not worrying about factors of two, okay, which can be, you know, might be quite important to an engineer, but, but we're not, we're not going to worry about factors of two and pi. Yes. I'm sorry? This is a minimal connectivity, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. Okay. So, so now, however, so one of the indications that some of these metals that we're going to talk about later are not conventional. So, for example, in, in the high temperature superconductors, this resistivity just goes straight through this limit without, without caring about it. Okay? And so one characteristic of a class of unconventional materials is that they violate this, this criterion. Okay? But we'll come back to that tomorrow as well. All right, good. So, so this is everything I've just said so far are things that are either in textbooks or in fairly... Uh, have a venerable, you know, this is from the Joffe and Regals from the 70s, sorry, uh, 60s, Mott is from the 70s, and maybe off by 10 years, but something like that. So these, these are well-established things. Okay. All right, so now what happens, so the rest of these lectures are about what happens when there are no quasi-particles, okay? So in, in the remainder, I want to talk about what happens What if there do not exist these quasi particles? So, first we need a definition of what it means for there to be um, uh, no quasi particles. So, what we're going to take as a definition is the following. Um, so, because it might not be obvious, right? I mean, you, you might, you might think that there are no quasi-particles. Theoretically, you might model a system, you might conclude that the coupling is strong and there should not be any quasi-particles, but for all you know, there might be a change of variables, there might be some emergent quasi-particles uh, that you haven't thought of. Okay, so we'd like to have a criterion for when there just does not exist a duality frame or some description in which things are weakly interacting. Okay, and so one notion of that, I think is, um, Subir has talked about for a while, but has been crystallized uh, recently, is, is that um, we'll say there are no quasi-particles if, sorry, let's do backwards, quasi-particles imply uh, that the thermalization time, uh, did, I, did I use TH? I'm not sure. Uh, the equilibration time scale. So we have a system at thermal equilibrium. You hit it a little bit and you wait to see how long it takes to locally re-equilibrate. Re this time scale is going to be very long. It's going to be much longer than this thermal time scale. Okay, because because the quasi particles interact weakly and they decay on much longer time scales than uh, than than this time scale. 
okay? They cannot, the thermal, thermalization is all about e equilibration, right? If I, if I hit the system, but then, so something has become energetic, but they don't talk to anything else, they can't reestablish equilibrium, okay? Uh, just, yes, go. No, this relates to this previous question. So, so, um, so this argument. Um, so one thing is whether there are weakly interacting excitations. Another one is if they're 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 momentum, like almost momentum eigenstates. Okay. So if there are well-defined excitations, and if they are momentum close to being momentum eigenstates, then the connectivity will indeed always be high. Yes, and and it is high in natural. Look, this thing here is. E squared over h bar. This is what, you know, as the way Steve Kilson and maybe others like to put it, if you're a theorist and you know nothing about a metal, a two dimension, say, and you want to estimate the conductivity, this is the value you'd pick. Okay, this is the natural units of conductivity, of uh, resistivity. I'm sorry. Um, oh, whoops. Uh, um, but, um, but in fact, copper and so on, the conductivity. The resistivity is much lower than this value, okay? And that's because they're weakly interacting. So indeed, most weakly interacting metals are good metals, okay? Yeah? Right. Does that imply that uh, it quickly? No, it equilibrates slowly. Yes. No, 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 it doesn't. So, so the, the, the high conductivity means that things travel for a long way without decaying. And that means that it hasn't re-equilibrated with its medium. So, so you're referring to global equilibration Sorry, yes, that's a good point. Indeed. So, indeed, this is local, yeah, indeed. Although, actually, well, yeah. <coughs> Maybe that helps. Yes, but in, indeed. So, but but I think the essence is, if things don't scatter, they carry charge efficiently and they decay slowly, and so they equilibrate slowly. Right? Let's put it this way: in the limit where the interaction goes to zero, the connectivity will be infinite, and it'll never thermalize. Right? Okay. So now we can use a logical statement that therefore, if tau equilibration is of order h bar kbt, then they cannot be quasi-particles, okay? So that's a diagnostic for the absence of quasi-particles. Of course, this thing may not always be easy to measure directly or easy to extract from the conductivity, but it's a, a in principle definition. What happens if the right quasi-particles, but there are no huge uh, momentum like Yeah, this, this criterion will still be true but how it relates to the connectivity will be more complicated. Good. So now, if there are no quasi-particles, that means that these single electron excitations just decay very quickly. And then so the next question you ask, well, what's left? Okay, yes. Uh, this is, let's think of this as a, give me one second and I'll, I'll come, we'll, we'll see. Essentially the point about this, this time scale is that it's, um, so if, if all couplings are order one, so okay, when, when might this happen? So, very good. So if I, yes, so very good. Interesting phases of matter that we're going to be talking about are gapless, okay, they, because if there's a gap, then they're going to be, it's going to be insulating, right? So, so to, be, for, to be able to conduct, if you're able to hit it a little bit and it conducts, there have to be gapless excitations, okay? So that means there's sufficiently low energies, there's no, there's no scale, right? Because it's, it's, because it's massless, there's no characteristic energy scale. And so if you're, and if your temperature is much lower than the gap and all couplings are order one, this is the only characteristic time scale that you have. That's a little fast, but that's the idea. Um, very good. So, if you all the quasi particles are gone, what's left? So, yes. Energy scales, even in gas, 
Yeah, this is a little fast, yes, yes. But actually, on the other hand, where, where, the way those actually show up are in, are in couplings, are in effective couplings. So, so this T squared that you get in the Fermi liquid, okay, you could think of that as so the, the, the lifetime, the inverse lifetime goes as T squared. You could really think of that as a T times a T over EF, okay? And this is an effective, this is, you can, if you want, you can think of this as a sort of an effective coupling. So, so, so I'm gonna, if there are other, right, if there are other scales, I'm gonna want, I'll, let me try to absorb them into this idea as, as, as effective couplings. Um, So tomorrow, I'm going to, we'll talk more about this kind of stuff, okay, if that's okay. This is at least a characteristic, this, okay, very good. This has the virtue of being a characteristic time scale that is well-defined in any system. Okay. Yeah. Good. I promise we'll talk more about it tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, so if all your quasi-particles have died, then um, what do you have left? And so what do you have left are conserved quantities. Okay, so for example, the total charge is the integral over space of the charge density. Okay, you can, you can, your electrons can bump into each other as often as they want, but charge is conserved, and so as an operator, Q dot is just zero. Okay, all right, so right, why do we care? Right, we care because the DC, the DC conductivity that's right, that is the limit, it only goes to zero of the frequency dependent connectivity. This is an IR, this is the low energy quantity, all right? Low energy means late times, and so this quantity is going to be determined by the slowest, process, the slowest decay in the system. We'll, we'll see that uh, this, this afternoon. And so the slowest decay, so we have to ask, if everything decays very fast, the things that will not decay quickly are, are conserved quantities, all right? And now, in, in momentum space, the total charge, so we can Fourier transform, so rho of k is just the Fourier transform of rho of x, and so the total charge q is rho of zero, right? It's the k equals zero mode, the uniform mode, so that thing doesn't decay, right? And continuity would suggest then that rho of k, so a sort of an excitation of the charge, a long wavelength excitation of the charge, should decay slowly, all right? It seems reasonable, right? So rho k dot should go to zero as k goes to zero, all right? So the total k equals zero is you take the total charge and you just try to move it up and down, and you just can't do that because it's conserved. So now taking, imagine taking a very big amount of charge, um, that should be able to, that should only change very slowly. Okay, because we like, well, continuity suggests that might be reasonable, right? Because as k goes to zero, a row of k should be conserved. And so that suggests that the long-lived quantities are going to be long wavelength excitations of conserved charges, okay? And so that then suggests, so we're getting close to hydrodynamics uh, now. So that then suggests that we have to know what the conserved quantities are. Okay, so what are the conserved quantities? And so the rest of the lectures are going to be organized by what the conserved quantities are. Uh, so today, almost certainly going into this afternoon, we're going to talk about the case where the conserved quantities are charge, energy, and momentum. Uh, tomorrow, it's just going to be charge and energy with no momentum. Okay. That's reasonable because, in fact, you might wonder whether momentum is ever conserved because in a metal there are impurities, there's a lattice, it's clearly not translation invariant. You might have thought we should never worry about momentum. Okay, but we'll talk a bit about momentum soon. But indeed, there are cases where you don't want to think about momentum. And then the only conserved quantities are charge and energy. And then on Friday, Um, we're going to think about charge and energy, uh, but also another example of a 
So it turns out conserved quantities are not the whole story. Other things that decay very slowly are Goldstone bosons. So if you spontaneously break a symmetry, you, you, get, a, you get a mold whose masslessness is protected. Okay, and that mode is always long-lived. Long wavelength excitations of that is always long-lived. And so we're also going to add Goldstone bosons. And in fact, we're going to talk about two types of Goldstone bosons. One where it's an internal symmetry. So that would be superfluids and superconductors. Spontaneously break a U1. And then we'll also talk about space-time symmetries. And this was, these will be charge density waves. Okay, so you spontaneously break translations. Uh, the, some interesting things happen, and we'll talk about that on Friday. Okay, so the plan, again, let me just say it one more time. I'm going to be interested in cases where there are no single particle excitations that are long lived. In that case, the longest lived things are conserved operators. Um, we're going to see how those determine the conductivity, and depending on what the long lived excitations are of a system, the conductivity can be very different. And that, that's what we're going to talk about. Yes? So, yes. So, for this case, you need to have an approximate... So, you need to put the momentum back in there. So, this, this, this will be relevant when there is an approximate translation symmetry that's spontaneously broken. So actually this guy is going to be a, what's called in, at least in high energy physics, a pseudo Goldstone boson. Okay? It's a spontaneously broken approximate symmetry. And actually that's quite a rich, it turns out, so pions are, are an example of this. So yeah, we'll come to that on Friday. But yes, you're totally right. We better have at least approximate translations before this makes sense. All right, that's the plan. Good. So, uh, so the theory of low energy, long wavelength excitations of a medium is called hydrodynamics. It's over 100 years old, and I'll tell you a bit about it now. Conventional metals are not hydrodynamic. Okay, so they're hydrodynamic in one sense that that um, energy and charge are conserved, and so if you look at very, very, very long wavelengths, um, they diffuse, okay, it's, it's relevant. However, they're not hydrodynamic because there are too many excitations, okay, that you have all of these. To describe a conventional metal, you have to keep track of infinitely many <coughs> long-lived modes, okay, and the equation that does that is called the Boltzmann equation. And now, if you take the Boltzmann equation and go to extremely long time scales, you will also get hydrodynamics, okay, um, which we'll also talk about in a minute. But really the time scale that enters is this, this tau was the decay of these single particle excitations, okay? And hydrodynamics is different. The time scales that enter are going to be the time scales at which, for example, momentum is not approximate, is not exactly conserved, all right? So again, conventional metals are not hydrodynamic because they don't thermalize quickly enough, okay? Hydrodynamics is about you establish local equilibrium very quickly and then you look at small, uh, small perturbations away from local equilibrium. A metal with quasi-particles does not reach local equilibrium quickly enough. All right. So this is very nice because it means that there's a sense in which the strongly coupled metals actually become easier in some sense in which because there are fewer variables that we have to keep track of and we can use these classical equations of hydrodynamics to describe them. All right, so let me remind you how hydrodynamics uh, works. Okay, so I'm missing a page. Oh, oh, it's, 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 I found it. Okay. Um, I should say, so uh, we recently finally finished this long, this long review article that, among other things, in section five, has an extended discussion of hydrodynamics as applied to metals and there's more information here. Okay. Very good. So, okay. So, let me tell you a few. Th so, the structure now is I want to tell you a few things about hydrodynamics in this case. And then, probably this afternoon, I'll talk a little bit about how that changes the various observables that I talked about before. Okay. How it impacts 
of course, you know, water-based hydrodynamics, right? It's not so. So these equations are not deep. Uh, in in well, they are deep, but they're not modern. But their their consequences for metals are quite unconventional compared to what you're going to find in a textbook. Okay. Good. So momentum. So first, I should say a few words about momentum. Um, so, right. Uh, So momentum can be long-lived in, 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 several, in several circumstances, okay? Um, so long-lived, I mean, now I'd like, again, okay, in a metal, momentum is never going to be exactly conserved because microscopically there clearly is not translation invariance, okay? So, but long-lived means we'd like the time scale for momentum to be much bigger <coughs> than, for example, any single particle excitations, okay? So that any given electron uh, decays very quickly, but the decay, the, the decay is conserved momentum for a, long, for a long time. This can happen, actually this can happen with quasiparticles if EG is very clean, so there's no disorder, and also if for some reason lattice scattering is suppressed. So lattice scattering goes under the name of umklapp. Okay, so that lattice scattering is when the momentum shifts by something, by the lattice wave vector. You scatter off the lattice. Um, and there are various circumstances, which I guess we'll talk about later, in which this can also be suppressed. Okay, but I'm going to colloquially refer to this as a clean limit. Okay, so that there's thinking that there's no disorder. Another, th but another way it can happen is that if um, if you have okay, sorry, I should say so. Whenever you have an emergent quantum field, emergent long wavelength quantum field theory description. So, in particular, all the quantum field theories that the other lecturers are going to write down. Okay. They're all translation. They, you, write, you, you write down a quantum field theory, it's a translation invariant quantum field theory. Okay? And so whenever there's an emergent long wavelength quantum field theory description, typically you also get an emergent translation invariance. Okay? And the translation invariance that acts on these emergent excitations, you shouldn't think of it too literally as the generator of translations in the UV. Okay? It's some, it's some, it's some, it's some which might be very strongly broken. Okay? Uh, so this is so the, right, if you write down a translation invariant quantum field theory that you believe applies at long wavelengths, then that implies uh, an emergent momentum that's not necessarily equal to the generator of microscopic translations. Okay. Sorry. Well, it generates translations in the emergent long wavelength description. It, well, I, I refer you to any of uh, uh, no errors. Are you going to write down a Lagrangian? <laughs> Ask errors. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, sorry. So, you know, yes. I mean, so for example, to describe uh, the quantum critical points. Yeah, perfect. Very good. Indeed. So, as I said at the beginning, you're going to hear all these talks about you know, complicated quantum field, th or interesting quantum field theories that describe things like quantum critical points. And what I'm talking about is how you calculate the conductivity in those theories. But for example, let's say maybe you've got some fermions. I mean, uh, I don't know which one, sh what should we do? Couple to a pneumatic boson or something. So you, you'll have something like psi dagger, dt, dx squared, forgive me all the i's and so on. Psi, and then there'll be a boson. Add phi squared, and there'll be some Yukawa coupling. So the theory of quantum criticality is replete with Lagrangians like these ones. Okay, and so these are this is a translation invariant, and there'll be a momentum operator that generates the translations. So momentum will be something like integral of a space of. Uh, <laughs> let me not embarrass myself, but uh, I guess there'll be. Uh, 
there'll be things like this and and, and other terms, right? So you, you just do a noeth, another transformation, generate trans in this Lagrangian, and you'll, you'll get you'll generate some conserved quantity. But this is going to have a very non-trivial relationship with any microscopic quantity that you want to write down. Okay, so I'm just trying to say that the microscopic system is just not going to be translation variant most of the time. But whenever you can restrict attention to some observables that are described by emergent long wavelength modes, and if these long, wa long, wave long wavelength modes can be described by Lagrangian like this, then there's an emergent conserved momentum. Which is some operator that you can define in terms of these operators, which are not the microscopic operators. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in low energies, long wavelengths, this E will play the role. Yes. The so energy. indeed, and that, that that's that's right, and that's that 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 is what happens roughly in in this case. Uh -huh. Yeah. So yeah. This so this inversion momentum is not the same. Well, sometimes it. So if you have a. So indeed, like what you what you said is is at, so basically the long wavelength limit of the lattice momentum is is if the sample is very clean and this umclap scattering is, is, is small, then, that, then it will, be, that will almost be conserved. But in, in, in these cases, this may or may not be the case. So I, all I want to say is it doesn't have to be the same as the microscopic momentum. That's all. I, all I need, all I want is a vectorial conserved quantity that, that, that appears in the effective description. But indeed, sorry, thank you. In, in plenty of cases, it may be the long wavelength limit of lattice momentum, yes. Is there an example, concrete example, of, uh, where we can work out those uh, field operators from microscopic? Um, I, guess you I mean, I think if you could do that, it w uh, th there may be solvable models in one plus one. I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure, but I mean, if you could do that, that would amount to solving the microscopic Hamiltonian, which is normally not something. I mean, the whole point of RG is that you sort of make a guess for what the IR is without uh, deriving it. Well, ask Erez and Subiru when they're giving their talks. <laughs> I mean, um, no, it, it, it's, it's not so far away from what, from what he said. I mean, if the scattering is clearly, there are some excitations that live on wavelengths that are much larger than the lattice momentum, okay? And so how strongly those are coupled to, to, to shorter wavelength processes depends on the theory, right? It's not impossible that you can imagine there's some collective excitation that occurs on many hundreds of lattice spacings and that it doesn't care too much that you can somehow renormalize out like short distance momentum non-conservation. That, that. But, um, but indeed, if you want to write down these theories, which many, many of our colleagues do, uh, there's an emergent momentum here. Okay. Yes? Not if, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that, uh, definitely we'll come to that this afternoon, okay? But, but to say it, very good. Well, to, to preempt what we're going to do. So there, there will be couplings to the lattice or to disorder, and these we should put in as some spatially, spatially dependent couplings that explicitly break translation invariance. And for this to be emergent, these couplings had better be irrelevant. They'd better go to zero, they'd better flow to zero at long wavelengths. If they don't flow to zero at long wavelengths, probably your system's going to become insulating, right? Okay, so another way to answer the question, indeed, right. So the, this question was, the way the question was asked before was, how can I go from the UV all the way down and somehow prove that there's this quantum field theory? You can't do that, but what you can do is make a guess what the IR theory is, and then you want to check that it's stable under RG flow. So then you start down here, then you put back in some, some coupling, and if these are irrelevant, then at least your guess is self-consistent, okay? And so that is the sort of thing that can happen, all right? Um, actually, an example of that is a Fermi liquid, where um, the umclap, which is scattering off the, la so I mean, a Fermi liquid, you can write <laughs> down a translation invariant theory 
you put back in the lattice, and so the lattice, that would be in a Fermi liquid, there's some spatially dependent coupling. Well, it's a lattice coupling, so it's actually something like cosine KL of X, and then there's a four fermion operator. And you can check that this is irrelevant in a, in a Fermi liquid. Okay. So that's, that's the way that the Fermi liquid forgets about the lattice is because the remnant of the lattice in the effective theory is, is irrelevant. And that also relates to a question earlier. The fact that this coupling is irrelevant is where this extra power actually of T over EF comes from in the resistivity. Any other questions? Yeah, but this, this I think part of Indeed, part of the reason that um, these discussions of the effects of momentum and hydrodynamics and metals is relatively modern, despite the subject being very old, is partly related to thinking carefully about these issues, actually. And it was not widely appreciated. I mean, I think it was appreciated, but kind of <laughs> uh, people weren't ready to deal with it. That in, that in all of these critical theories of people writing down, the, there's a conserved momentum. And it really changes how you have to calculate the connectivity in these theories, that there's a momentum. Okay. Very good. Uh, all right. So suppose you do have, so we're going to consider today, we're just going to consider the case with momentum. We'll see what the consequences are, and we'll see if that agrees with some, some nice experiments from last year. Um, but... Uh, Right, so what does suppose? So let's just assume we do have momentum now. Okay, that, that's that's what we're doing. So how do you see momentum? So there are two effects. Well, there are probably many effects, but there are two important classes of effects. One is that once momentum is conserved, it can also be transported around, like like charge and heat. And in particular, uh, so transport of momentum is related to viscosity particularly the sh shear viscosity. So if I have a, my medium, I take two plates, and I move one of the plates, I'm, I'm putting in momentum here. And then if the other plate starts to move, gets dragged, that because momentum has been transported from here to here. Okay? And the shear viscosity is how efficiently this momentum that I put here shows up over there. Okay? So the shear viscosity measures a transverse transport of momentum, okay? So let's take a look at shear viscosity. So one way to look for a conserved momentum is to look for a sh viscous effects in metals, okay? If you can see, and so how would you, uh, to, to jump a little bit, for example, how do you see viscous effects in metals? One effect might be is a strong dependence on the width of your material, okay? So if there's some assumption about boundary conditions, but let's say that, and you've got some current. You have an electric field and you have some current going along here. One, a natural boundary condition is that the current has to be zero at the edges of the sample. Okay, some rough, rough boundary condition, as, it, as it's called. Now, if, if there's no viscosity, that's just totally irrelevant. Here, here uh, there's no momentum, but very close by, you immediately get a strong momentum. But viscosity, if, if, when it's viscous, this lack of momentum here propagates in a bit further, and you'll get some kind of sort of profile for the currents, okay? Due to the, due to the fact that it, it feels the boundary conditions because of because of viscosity, and so one place, and and you can derive. You just have to solve basically the Navier-Stokes equation in, in this in this um, in this tube, and you you can calculate what the width dependence of the resistivity will be. Okay, so for example, one signal of a viscous effect in a metal is that the width dependent of the resistivity is 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 different. Okay, that that's something you can do. So these are yeah, viscous effects that will absolutely not be there in a, in a Fermi liquid. Yes, well, most of the time. Yeah. Uh, I think actually, if I remember correctly, uh, it's one over omega squared. Uh, yes, yes, in two, 2D. Yes, yes, maybe it's cubed in 3D. That sounds, uh, you know, uh, I don't think so actually because because essentially where this comes from 
is that you have a Navier-Stokes equation, and there's a viscosity times del squared of V, and this, visco this del squared becomes a 1 over W squared. So I, th I think it's quite natural that it, it comes up in that combination, but I might be wrong. If, uh, very good. If, if uh, so with some exceptions, so if you have an extremely clean Fermi liquid where, where, um, where the Fermi surface is very small and so there's no umclap scattering, uh, then it's negligible. However, in a Fermi liquid, even though there are quasi-particles, if it's super clean, you can get to a regime where momentum lives much longer than all the quasi-particles. That's not generic, but it, it can happen. And then you can also have hydrodynamics in, in that effect. But indeed, in, a, in copper, this is a totally negligible effect. Yes, because uh, yes, because there's there's no everything decays on a very short mean. Free, um, yeah, there's no momentum. So this, this there, there are other boundary effects. It's not that there's no boundary dependence because, for example, you have quasi particles. They live a long time, and sometimes they can just hit the boundary of the sample. So that's something you can calculate, and it's a different effect from this one. Okay, and the other. So this is what we'll come, I'll come back to this and I'll show you some, well, there's some experimental plots in these notes. Another, another set of uh, effects is just have to, has to do with the fact that um, the tau, the lifetime that enters in all of the formulae is no longer the quasi-particle lifetime. It's going to be the momentum relaxation lifetime. And we'll see that this has big consequences for things like the ratio of thermal to electric conductivity, for example. Okay. Well. Good. So with that, let's let's talk a little bit about hydrodynamics. Okay. So the next uh, half hour and so this afternoon are things that someone could have been up here telling you a hundred years ago, but they wouldn't have been talking about metals. At least 50 years ago, for sure. Okay. Good. So, um, but is, I hope it's clear where the motivation is clear, right? The idea is that uh, with strong interactions, you should really care about conserved charges because they're all you have, right? You, 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 don't, you don't have anything else. It's all gone. And, and so we want to see, and the right language for these conserved charges is hydrodynamics, and we want to derive the consequences in metals of having a hydrodynamic regime. Okay, and so now we have to talk about hydrodynamics. Yeah. So the equations of hydrodynamics are, are, are very simple. So that, that it goes in two steps. So firstly, there are conservation laws. So this would be um, charge, energy, and momentum. So these are, are the conserved densities, and these are the associated currents, the electrical heat and the stress. Or is it strain? I always forget which one's which. Um, okay, so, but these equations are not enough because there are more variables in equations, so we can't do anything with it. All right? So then there's another set of equations, and these are also exact, and the whole point of hydrodynamics is to make some kind of approximation. And so there are another set of equations called the constitutive relations, And this is the following. So now the idea is to close the equations, we want to express J, these guys, in terms of these guys. And we're going to do that in a gradient expansion. Right. Do I want to say anything else first? Yes, but before we do that, let me say something else. So this is just to clean up the notation a little bit. So here we talk about energy, but actually it's more convenient to talk in terms of the entropy. And so these are related, so the very a variation, a small change in the energy is of course T times a small change in the entropy, plus the chemical potential times a small change in the charge, plus the velocity times a small change 
in the momentum. Okay, so this formula is from thermodynamics and it's helpful because it introduces various things. So we've talked about the dense, so we're going to use this formula for two things. Firstly, we're going to trade fluctuations of energy for fluctuations of entropy because entropy is more directly connected to the temperature. Okay, so when we apply a temperature gradient, it really creates, I mean, it creates an energy flow, but it's better to think of it as a heat flow or an entropy, an entropy current. Okay, so it's, it's going to be nice to think in terms of entropy. Of course, entropy is not conserved beyond linear order. At quadratic order, there's heating. But in terms of uh, when, we, when we're doing linearized perturbations, entropy is also is conserved. Okay, heating is a quadratic effect. It goes like E squared. The dual heating goes like the electric field squared. Uh, so at, within linear response, we can think of the entropy as sort of conserved. And also, this equation now introduces uh, the sources dual to the conserved current. So these are, these are the conserved quantities. And then their sources are temperature, chemical potential, and uh, velocity. <coughs> and in fact, it's often more convenient not to solve the equations for, for, for the densities, for, for fluctuations of the charges. Actually, I'm just going to write pi, because in equilibrium, we're going to assume we're at, at, that pi is zero. So we can trade these fluctuations for fluctuations in the temperature, fluctuations in the local chemical potential, and, and the velocity. And these are the variables that we're going to use. Um, and how are they related? So for example, um, remember, let's think about the charge. So the charge, so suppose we only had charge, just to make it easier. The charge is the derivative of the free energy with respect to the chemical potential. And so a fluctuation in the charge is d rho d mu delta mu. And this is now the second derivative of the free energy. I uh, might have missed some minus signs. It doesn't matter. Mu squared delta mu. OK? So fluctuations of the densities are related to fluctuations of the sources by what I'm going to call the thermodynamic susceptibility. So this is called the compressibility. For the thing that relates, thing that relates uh, energy, uh, sorry, entropy and temperature is, is the specific heat. And this is the second derivative of the free energy with respect to temperature. Okay, so I'm saying we can go, actually I've written, so more generally there's a matrix. So you have fluctuations of charge and entropy and they're related to variations in the chemical potential and the temperature by a matrix of thermodynamic susceptibilities. Okay, so we can always go between local changes in the chemical potential and local changes in the density by this. These are basically a bunch of constants. Th th there's nothing interesting in these chi's. Okay. So we get to choose what, what these relationships mean is that within linear response, within linear, linear, linearized hydrodynamics, you can choose between this set of variables or this set of variables. Okay. <laughs> And they're related, so you can either think about local fluctuations of the temperature or local fluctuations of the entropy. All right? That, 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 yes? And um, is it often said why you can, uh, why you don't have a general C by C matrix? Why momentum doesn't Right, just because momentum is a vector and these are scalars. So there's, there's also a relationship um, for momentum. So they, they can't mix. So we're going to assume, very good, we're going to assume, we've already assumed translation invariance, and let's also assume isotropy. Um, then they can't mix, and indeed, the momentum is related to the velocity by uh, a certain susceptibility that I call chi pi pi. But this you know, for example, in a Galilean invariant theory, this is the mass. In a Lorentz invariant theory, this would be E plus P. Okay, but in general, it's just some constant, or some some temperature, some thermodynamic quantity. So you know what 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 you should have in your what you have in your mind, right? Is that the free energy is is some equilibrium value, and then when you perturb it away from equilibrium, it's quadratic. Remember, the free energy is a function of the sources mu, t, and v, and so there's a quadratic term, and the coefficient of that is this susceptibility, and that relates 
fluctuations of the charge to fluctuations of the chemical potential. Yeah. Um, okay, before we go on, there's just one more thing I have to introduce. So this defined the entropy in terms of the energy. And so with the entropy comes an entropy current. So the entropy within linear response uh, satisfies S dot plus the divergence of the heat current over the temperature. And so the heat current is the energy current that appeared there minus mu times the electric current. And it's, it's just often convenient to, instead of energy, think about entropy and the heat currents. Okay, and it's what heat currents related to energy by this. Hopefully that's plausible. Forget about this term. This term is often, because both V and pi vanish in equilibrium, this term is often higher order. And so this is just the current version of Je being, uh, well, I should be careful the temperatures. Okay, you can derive this from this definition and these conservation laws. Okay. Yes. So there first. Yeah. Right. So this is adlinear or linearized. So you could have a space dependence of t, but t times j that will be higher order once you have a, a j as well. So that makes sense. So so if I've grad. Uh, So yes, I could move this t outside the derivative because this jq is already first order. And so derivatives of t, that would be a quadratic effect. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what you were asking? Yeah. Could you please repeat why uh, do you neglect the third term? OK, uh, <coughs> yes, I, I, I was very fast. So it, it is there, and it's going to be important in a minute. But for many purposes, so t and mu have background values in equilibrium that are non-zero. V does not, we, we, by, by choice. So we're, we're going to consider equilibrium states where the momentum and the velocity are zero. And so when you perturb away from them, this is a higher order effect in that perturbation because this background V is zero, is zero in equilibrium. So this is a quadratic, this is a quadratic term in, in fluctuations away from equilibrium. We'll, we'll see this in a minute. So for many purposes, you don't have to worry about that term. Okay, so that was a little interlude to introduce a bunch of things. Okay, so we have conservation laws. The conservation laws are laws for these conserved densities. You can also think about fluctuations of the sources, and they're related by this, and uh, entropy is useful. Okay, um, very good. So now the idea of the constitutive relations is to take all of these, to get some closed equations, you take these. So for example, you take J. And now we're gonna, we want to write J in terms of these variables in a derivative expansion. Right? The idea is that hydrodynamics is a long wavelength approximation. Um, and so we do a derivative expansion. Oh, sorry. Uh, actually, you write J dot. Yeah. No? Uh, what am I? <coughs> no, no, no. Just, just J. Sorry, J. All right. So what do we have? So J is a vector. And so at zeroth order in derivatives, uh, we could put a pi in there, which is also a vector. Now, it's going to be more useful. We, it's equally good, but it's going to be more useful for what I want to do to use these variables. So I'm going to put a v. Okay, and there's some coefficient here, a, which a priori we don't know. Right? Then we have to go to next order in derivatives. So what do we have? We can have a d spatial derivative of, uh, of t. And we could have a spatial derivative of mu. And let's call this coefficient kappa bar sub zero. The minus sign will be useful. And let's call this sigma sub zero. But they're just coefficients plus dot, 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 higher order in derivatives. OK, so, so at higher order, there's a, so we, we, everything now, from now on, is going to be linearized perturbations away from equilibrium. And here we're furthermore doing a gradient expansion. So now there'll be second derivatives and, and so on and so forth. Is that OK? So now the idea is we're going to take this and plug this back into here, and then we'll get a closed set of equations, which is the hydrodynamic equations of motion. Right. So similarly, 
um, uh, JQ. So we're going to work in terms of JQ is some number times V minus, oh, whoops, uh, sorry, that's alpha zero. Uh, maybe even bar, okay, so alpha zero bar. It's going to be kappa zero times dt minus some alpha zero d mu. And then there's momentum. So let's talk about momentum. So now we have to ex expand this Tij. So what can we have here at zeroth order? Well, we can have a delta Ij. Um, let's call this C. It's not a constant. This is going to be, well, in general, it could be a function of mu and t. There. It'll get fixed in a minute. Right? Any, any scalar uh, quantity. And then the higher order terms are di, vj. Symmetrized version is called the viscosity. And then the sort of the divergence is related to the bulk viscosity. Uh, minus, okay, and so on. It's the same idea, right? There's a, there's a zeroth order term in derivatives. Then there's a first order term in derivatives. And you put whatever you can put. It's just fixed by what you can write in terms of these v, t, and mu. May I ask a question? Yes, of course. If this zeta is the same zeta you have previously in uh, relation to delta rho and delta I'm sorry, no, it's not. <laughs> but this, this, if this is a very fleeting appearance. It's not going to appear again. Um, but it's a different one. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you're running out of, we're running out of Greek letters. Maybe we should start using the Hebrew alphabet. All right. Um, I'm sorry? Uh, not, not, not yet. So diffusion, we're not, not, not diffusion yet. We're going to get there in a minute. But, but so far, we're gonna, in a minute, we're going to solve these equations and find out what the modes are. Okay? But these are just parameters. We're just doing a derivative expansion of the, of the parameters. So very good. So we've traded it for so we've traded rho uh, epsilon well rho entropy and pi for mu t and v. But they're in one to one correspondence. Yeah. Yes. I'm sorry, say say again. I'm just saying there's gonna be some function here. Uh, it's not the free energy. <laughs> uh, some function of of scalar of scalar quantities. It's not zero, no. It's going to be the pressure in a minute. Yeah? Yes. Correct, yes. You'd have to have dt and also be nonlinear. Well, you'd either have to have a velocity, yes, or, or it'd be nonlinear. Of course, you can go to higher orders, and people do. But yeah, good. OK, so then we're almost ready to plug this in here. And so someone mentioned diffusion. You know, you can sort of see how it might work. If you think of this d mu is sort of morally analogous to a d rho, let's just think about this term. You plug it in here. You'll have rho dot, derivative, derivative of rho. That's a diffusion equation for rho, right? So that's how these modes are going to come out. But life is more complicated because we have this velocity hanging around. Okay? So we're not just going to get diffusive modes, we're also going to get sound modes. And that's that's has a big consequence for for the connectivities. Good. So let's see, where could we put them? So you've got a mu. We've got to get two indices. Alright, so we, we have delta ij, that that's this one. Okay. Um This would be second order. <laughs> this is one derivative, but we need another. Sorry, we need another derivative. So this would be second order. So you could take another derivative. That's higher order in derivatives. So there's just nothing you can write down. There isn't either nonlinear or higher order in derivatives. Yeah. So this is a very mundane 
this can get complicated when you start breaking parity and have to worry about exactly what terms you can add, but in principle, it's a straightforward, you just write down everything you can. But before we find the modes, so before we do what I just said, we've got to be a little careful, and actually this A, B, and this guy are actually fixed. Okay, and um, so there's some constraints. So there's, there, there exist constraints. On, on these constitutive relations. And these are the most important of which is positivity of entropy production. Which is that the total entropy should not increase. And so in terms of the density, this means that S dot minus the divergence of this entropy current, which will be a total derivative, should be positive or not, not negative. Right. <coughs> for all possible, so for all possible fluid configurations, this needs to be true. Now, in old fashioned hydrodynamics, a la Landau Lifshitz, this is an axiom, an extra axiom of hydrodynamics. Very recently, in the last, uh, let's say five, 10 years, there's been a lot of work actually deriving this. Okay, so nowadays, it's actually not, you can actually derive it. But we're going to take uh, the old-fashioned point of view and just, this is an axiom, okay? It's a constraint. But it, I'm just telling you that it, it is derivable. Um, but that, that's more work than we want to do. So it's reasonable, and so we're just going to impose this. So I want to give you a flavor, uh, and I guess this will be the last. I want to do a little calculation that, just so that you've seen how it goes. And so this... So for example, what's positivity of entropy production going to do? It's going to do things like constrain this sigma zero to be positive. This kappa zero, actually kappa bar zero, is going to be positive. Uh, alpha zero bar is going to equal alpha zero. Um, but actually, it also fixes. See, do I have another color? Yeah. It's also going to fix, and this is what I'll show you, this A has to be rho. This has to be the entropy, and this has to be the pressure. Okay? And so now, this is the one thing I want to emphasize here is that often this is argued for on the basis of some kind of boost argument. So you're at rest, okay? You, there's a charge, you run against the charge, you see a current coming towards you. What's the current going to be? Well, it's going to be the charge density times the velocity, okay? However, we're going to derive this without any, just from entry production, okay? So it's always true that there's a row here, an entropy there, and a pressure here, okay? But it is the intuitive statement that, that what, of what I just said, right? That if, if the thing's moving, it carries a current given by the charge density, right? So let, let's derive, well, let's at least check that these are consistent with this entry production argument. Yes? Yes. Yes, sorry, very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, th thanks a lot. Yes. So entropy is not conserved. It is conserved within linear response. Um, but at, at quadratic level, we want this to be positive. And we'll see how... I'm sorry, where? So, see? Uh, what do I have? Sorry, yes. Uh, well, we're about to derive it, so. Uh, yes, that sounds right, yes. So, say again? This this is JQ, which is the same as the as the same as the one we defined. Yeah. But indeed, so actually what's gonna happen? So at linear level, we want to get zero here. And um and a, and a quadratic order we want it to be positive. Um good. Yes, yes, please. Why there are no terms uh, which depend on mu, the expression for tau? Tau, tau, tau. 
here? Yeah. I mean, this P is a function of mu and temperature. So let's see, where else would you like to put them? So, um, um, at, at, with, at linear order and fluctuations, and at first order and derivatives, yes. Of course, the eta, this viscosity will also depend on, on, on mu, but what, what is not appearing here are, fluctu are sort of yeah. fluctuations Why delta mu. Why do they not enter? Okay. Why do they not enter? So let's see. So what, what term could we write down? So this, we need something with two indices. Yeah. So we have this, that's this one. So this, this, this is like a delta p. Um, so that's this one, okay. And so apart from that, uh, well, what? So we need to get two indices on this somehow, okay. So how we? So we can't take two derivatives because that would be second order, okay. If we take no derivatives, we have that one. If we take one derivative, we still need another index, and the only other index we have is v. But now this is quadratic in fluctuations because both delta mu and v are the other other fluctuations. So at a linear order in fluctuations, and at first order in derivatives, there's just nothing we can write down. You mean this? You mean this one? Yeah. Right. So it turns out that what has to appear here is dp. So there is, there is. This is some particular combination of d mu and dt that has to appear. Okay. Ah, uh, very good. That's a good. Uh, it doesn't. Um, ah, I thought. Well, it's isotropic. So we're, we're, we're going to take a. We're, we're, we've taken an isotropic. Uh, medium, wait, now it could be anti symmetric, and um, I guess I want to preserve. Uh, do I want to preserve parity? Is that enough? Yeah, I'm just worried. So it, yeah, I, I, um, I just, I don't know if there are extra hidden assumptions, but may, maybe, I don't know if you need parity, actually. Uh, my collaborators, no. <laughs> it's the same as four I, no, I thought it be epsilon ij is still a, no, but that was the question. <coughs> yeah, uh, yes, okay, let, yes, 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 yes. So we can, yes, 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 yes. Yes, it does have to be symmetric. But let me. Um, I, in the two minutes left, I just want to do this argument. We can. I'm pretty sure it is symmetric. But we can think about why in a minute. Um, so I want to show you how. I just want to show you this this argument at work at the kind of trivial level. Okay, at zeroth order, where it's actually not not dissipative, and we're going to see that these terms are how it fixes these terms. Okay. Okay, so let's just, this is little calculations. So let, let me just, so what's the, what's S dot? So we, we find S dot by taking the formula that was here that I erased that has the related delta S, delta E, delta mu, and delta pi, okay? So ds is, S dot is epsilon dot minus, minus mu rho dot minus V pi dot of the temperature. Okay, that just comes from taking DDT of the formula that I wrote before. Now we use conservation on these three guys. Okay, so that's minus the divergence of JE minus mu div J plus the divergence of tau over T. Right? I use conservation. And now what we do is we we, we write this as, as D of minus D of JQ. So JQ is uh, over T. So that's, um, I take this T inside, I take the T inside there, but then I have to subtract it off, right? So I'm taking the T inside, so then we have plus JE dot D one over T, right? That's when I take the, this has a JE over T in it, and I have to subtract off the, the derivative hitting the T. And then similarly here, uh, right, the do thing the mu is inside, so there's a minus j 
Let me get this right. J over T D mu. And then this term doesn't change. This is in the notes, so I'll just be a, let's keep this like this. Okay. So this term is good, so we want this term and we want this term. And now what we have to show is this is now quadratic, right? It's a current times the gradient of T, right? The gradient of T is zero in equilibrium. So we're already first order away from equilibrium. And so this whole thing here is, is quadratic, okay? In, in, in perturbations. Um, so this D of T is just T, is D, that's DT over T squared minus. Um, good, and now we use the constitutive relations to show you, give you a feel for how, how this thing works. So let, let's look at this term. So this JE, and I'm only going to look at the leading order terms, okay, it's pretty simple. So this term has a SV in it, so there's going to be an SV times dt over t squared. This term is going to have a, this is um, minus rho V t mu over t, and this term has a plus, I think there's a minus here, plus v over t, and dt, the leading term where we said it was the pressure, so that's uh, dp uh, times, sorry, becomes dp. Yes, right, because dt, right, t i j was p delta i j, and so this just becomes dp. All right, so this plus high order terms. Okay, so now we could have a configuration that has a temperature gradient and a chemical potential gradient and a velocity, and if we change the direction of the velocity, we could change the sign of all of these terms, and we could make s dot negative, which we don't want to be able to do. So the only way that for all configurations, we can cancel these terms as if they all cancel. And actually with this choice of S, rho, and P, they do because dP, as you may remember, is in fact S dT plus rho d mu. Okay, that's a thermodynamic identity. Okay, the way I remember it is that the pressure is equal to minus the free energy in this ensemble. Okay. So, so actually these terms cancel and, and we're okay. All right, so positivity of entry production, and it's sort of clear this is the only way it's gonna, it's gonna work because you have to have some function here that whose derivative is equal to the derivative of t and the derivative of mu with the right coefficients and the, the thermodynamic quantity that does that is the pressure, all right? So that's an example of how positivity of entry production imposes constraints <laughs> on, the, on the coefficients that appear in the constitutive relations, okay? And higher and higher order, it just gets more and more complicated so what happens, so for example, what's something that you might find higher on is, for example, the grad mu squared times this sigma zero, right? Now here you're fine, because this is manifestly positive, and so sigma, it's sufficient for sigma zero to be positive, it's not set to zero, right? So the, the name of the game is to take all the terms and to write them as a sum of squares, and the coefficients of the sum of squares have to be positive, and anything that you can't write as a sum of squares typically has to be zero, because you could reverse the, the, the direction of something and, and change the sign of the entry production, okay? So this is a good place to stop. So um, this afternoon we will uh, start looking at the, the, mode, the solutions to this equation and see how they impact the connectivity.